What's going on guys? This is Saw is War and it is a great day to talk about wrestling because we are officially one week away from SummerSlam, which is shaping up to be a really huge card. I know it's it's one of the four biggest WWE pay-per-views of the year, so kind of don't expect anything less than that, but it is it is shaped up very quickly uh, and and across all of wrestling seems like a lot of companies are really hitting these creative peaks as they build towards these huge shows to end the summer. So this week is going to be a little bit more of just a, a recap type of show, touch on a couple things, uh, have the full SummerSlam preview next week as well, of course. So let's just dive into it and see what's been going on in the world of wrestling. On the WWE side, it's pretty obvious. It's been building towards SummerSlam and this week was no different. Raw was another strong episode. NXT continues to be cooking as they move towards the first night of the two-week Great American Bash event. And then on SmackDown, it was a little bit different. It was a little underwhelming. It was a pre-taped episode because the SmackDown roster is overseas doing a tour of Japan right now that on social media it's looking like it's like the coolest thing ever. Uh, but the show was a little weak uh, as a result of that. But that's okay because... I don't know if there's too much more to be added to the SummerSlam card now after this. So Monday Night Raw was packed with a bunch of different things. The biggest, I don't know what the biggest development prob probably is the fact that CM Punk has officially been cleared from injury. He made the announcement, came out to the ring, said, I'm cleared. Drew McIntyre, come get some. And right after that, it was, oh, no, the, it, since you're cleared, we're going to have a match at SummerSlam. And that's awesome. This has been the feud of the summer of the year, really. And the fact that they've been able to build to this without any type of like actual physical contact or, or anything like that, aside from like a couple little things like Punk pulling McIntyre's leg out and hitting him with the, the brace and the chair or the, the belt or McIntyre, you know, carrying that, that awesome shot of McIntyre carrying Punk into the building like with the door rising up like there it hasn't been a whole lot of physical stuff they've been telling the story mostly just through shots on social media and promos back and forth so the fact that it is it is such a good feud with them having n no contact really whatsoever really gives me a lot of high expectations here i think mcintyre is going to really help punk look good and i i kind of get the feeling punk was cleared a little while ago because we've been seeing these clips of him down in NXT training with people and a lot of a lot of NXT stars have been posting about working out with him. So I kind of feel like he's been cleared for longer than they're letting on just so he could get some of the ring rust off before coming back. Cuz I don't think with him being such a big star and, and obviously so crucial to so much of what WWE is planning as far as expansion goes with you know the move to netflix and the the deals they're going to be looking for and him as a merchandise mover and an ambassador there was a whole thing this week about what his value is to the company and and what his contract is going to look like when he re-signs or he wants to restructure there was all sorts of contract stuff about him and i can't imagine they would take him after one match the royal rumble tears his tricep off the bone i don't think they would be like okay you're cleared we're one week away from SummerSlam. Now you should probably start working out. So I feel like there's something there and he's going to be in a lot better shape than we're expecting. I hope that's the case because CM Punk is one of my favorites. I will, as long as he is a, a wrestler, I will be a fan of CM Punk, the wrestler, but I think Drew McIntyre, regardless of, of the conditioning or anything that Punk is in, I think McIntyre is the perfect person to kind of, carry him and help him along into a, a really good match and to to top it all off the Bret Hart Shawn Michaels undertaker of it all Seth Rollins was announced as the guest referee which I kind of don't like for two reasons one the feud is so good between Punk and McIntyre that I don't think it needs the shenanigans of a guest referee but also like Seth Rollins kind of deserves better it's one of the four largest WWE pay-per-views and one of your best in-ring workers and biggest stars is just going to be a ref, a guest ref. Obviously, it's a high-profile match and he's he's been really a big part of obviously feuding with Punk, but with this this feud in particular the last couple weeks. So 
I see the benefit of getting him in the in the in the show and on the card, but it just feels weird. Like it feels too clear what's going to happen with all of this. Like Rollins is going to screw someone over accidentally and cost the match and then that's going to build into whatever the next feud is going to be. So tons of stuff going on there, but above everything else, above all of that that I just said. CM Punk and Drew McIntyre in ring is going to be one of the hottest matches of SummerSlam weekend, I'm sure. Just based off of just crowd excitement and how they've been able to build it to this point. Another nice part of this rivalry between Punk and McIntyre has been the social media trolling that these guys have been doing. In particular, Drew McIntyre, who has leveled up in ways that I did not expect at all. Uh, if you had told me at the start of the year that this would be going on, I would have been stunned. But this dude is continually just taking all sorts of shots. And his latest one was actually kind of a blink and you miss it. He posted on social media a picture of him and the artist formerly known as Jungle Boy, the scapegoat Jack Perry, with the caption, Yes, this is a real photo. Uh, and it was deleted about an hour later, maybe two hours later. And of course, after that, everyone was like, oh man, CM Punk got mad. The call came in. Triple H, oh man, this is crazy. I can't believe it. But of course, wrestling journalists, the insiders and everybody within like a day were posting that CM Punk and McIntyre are actually working super close together. And Punk is, is signing off on every single shot and reference at his time in AEW as well and those two guys are just locked in on creating the best possible story and that, that's kind of a like it's a bummer of a rumor killer because the the thought of them going back and forth and taking these shots is just such a a fun thing to think about but it is cool to see them you know willing to go to that level to push it and to, to continue to try to blur that line so, I, like I said before, I'm really excited for what I think this match could be. And then last week, we finally got Chad Gable reunited. And then last week, we finally had the Creed Brothers teaming up with Chad Gable to be a revamped Alpha Academy of sorts. They had that segment with the Wyatt Six. Uh, now, this week, they came out to confront Chad Gable's previous Alpha Academy faction, only to be interrupted again by the Wyatt Six where Uncle Howdy delivered a huge Sister Abigail to Chad Gable, and the uh, entire building went nuts. It was such a cool moment to see. It was such a nice tribute. It was like the most emotional <laughs> Sister Abigail I can ever remember. He hit it perfect. Chad Gable sold it like a million bucks. I'm so glad we're finally starting to, to build towards things. I think this probably means we're going to get a match added to SummerSlam between the two factions but i don't really know yet i still think it's kind of weird that you finally pull the trigger on giving chad gable this big heel push with this heel stable and it kind of feels like this isn't the group to to put him up against is that first big push that first big moment just because the the wyatt six are going to be unlike anything else presentation wise but Still, if it gets all of them on the SummerSlam card and gives us something that is a completely different flavor to the rest of the matches that we're going to have, I think it's going to be something really cool. And, and of all the people to pair up with them, obviously Chad Gable is one of the best because he will make every single person that he comes into the ring with look like a complete million bucks. And then, of course, the biggest story on Raw, Week in and week out, multiple segments, especially now, we have a women's title match official for SummerSlam, Rhea Ripley versus Liv Morgan. It is not the custody of Dominic Mysterio match that everyone was hoping for, but continues to unfold like in the most like 90s Attitude Era ass way. Like, if this is the the tease for what it's gonna be like on Netflix, like this is unbelievable like it feels like a like segments like that are out of a time capsule compared to the rest of the show so dominic mysterio was still trying to win back rhea ripley's affection and Liv morgan once again came out and tried to stir the pot and it was like i said wild to see on wwe now after all these years but it ended with dominic mysterio exploding at Liv Morgan in Spanish and just completely berating her 
and sending her off in tears and Rhea Ripley super happy <laughs> licks his face and Michael Cole the best reaction of the week probably is Michael Cole watching this happen uh, they put they put video up of that a couple days later like incredible Michael Cole just a gem of an announcer especially in these last few years without Vince uh, just unbelievable work that he has been doing and so it looks like everything is right in the Judgment Day world, except we all know, of course, it is not. That's probably going to be the biggest thing on the Raw side coming out of SummerSlam, is what is likely going to be the dissolution of the Judgment Day. I'm assuming Dominic Mysterio costs Rhea Ripley. I'm assuming the rest of the Judgment Day turns on Damian Priest. Uh, we'll see. Like I said, predictions are next week, so I don't want to get ahead of myself here, but continues to be one of the dominant topics in all of WWE programming. So clearly it's building to some type of a head of or a climax or conclusion. Uh, so we'll see. But this was, like I said, just like out of a completely different era. I, I could not believe it. NXT, uh, like I said, they're building towards the Great American Bash. They continue to be one of the best shows wrestling wise on television every week. Shawn Michaels is is just in his bag at this point he has got such good command over so many of these stories there were some things that i wasn't like super sold on so they had this big match this big no disqualification match between brooks jensen and josh briggs the former teammates and brooks jensen is back after this weird blur the lines story where he was like released from wwe but then like struggled with drinking and was like breaking into nxt and like trying to get on screen and beg for a job like really weird line bl line blurring things uh he's finally back with this storyline being that he gets one more chance it's kind of funny that they're running him like brian pillman when they have brian pillman's son on the roster as well it's such an odd odd thing but Brooks Jensen out here wrestling in cargo pants and Converse. Like, I cannot fathom how uncomfortable that is to be rolling around and running around and performing all these things in some cargo pants and some Converse. Like, I can't believe they played basketball in Converse in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, let alone now with all the, the technology and shoes and boots and everything, I'm sure. That's that's wild. That's a different breed. And it also looks like they're going to be pairing him up with Sean Spears, who his whole character since he came back has kind of been like unlocking, you know, the real you. Like, let's see the real you. And it's it's, you know, kind of a tried and true topic for wrestling. Uh, it's what Bray Wyatt did with John Cena back in the day in their WrestleMania build. It's kind of what Uncle Audi is doing now in the Wyatt Six with Chad Gable. Uh, and it's just, it's almost old reliable in the wrestling world, I, I feel like, as far as storylines go. But Sean Spears is a great person to put with Brooks Jensen as they continue to try to get this character established and over. And then speaking of NXT making good moves, they've got Ashanti the Adonis and Cedric Alexander down in NXT right now. And Cedric Alexander finally getting a spot on NXT to just wrestle consistently on television is like the best decision they could do. He had a match with Trick Williams that it wasn't a five-star classic, but it was a great way to get a different side out of Trick Williams. Like a more aggressive, like, oh, hey, he's really like pushing it uh, type of style. And I really appreciated that. I appreciated seeing him get that opportunity to kind of show a little more to his character, to round out his in-ring work a little bit more. And I think that's something that Cedric Alexander is going to be like invaluable with is just to throw him in the ring with basically anybody and you've got a good match that is like the the bones for a good match are already there i am, am really a big fan of his i think he is one of the most underrated in-ring wrestlers on the roster i don't think he gets enough opportunity to showcase that and especially since the the dissolution of the hurt business and everything he has not gotten the abilities to really show like he, what he could do like back on the 205 live days so I think him in NXT is going to be huge. I don't expect him to have like giant feuds and big wins and title reigns and everything. It'd be nice. I would like to see it, but I feel like he is there to just week in and week out be like the person you call when you need a great match. And maybe he wins some and maybe he's putting over the younger generation and, and kind of helping them find their footing. But 
it is such a good use for him and it is so good to see him back on tv hopefully consistently and then like i said on smackdown it was a pre-taped show a couple good moments there was a cody rhodes pre-tape where he talked about his SummerSlam main event with solo sokoa which i don't know if anyone's gonna think that solo could win by the time the bell rings for the match but Cody did a nice job of selling the the creeping doubt, and I think they've been doing a really good job overall of how they've presented Solo Sokoa and the Bloodline, but it kind of feels like this story, this Solo Sokoa Bloodline like spinoff, is building towards a feud with the original Bloodline, and it doesn't need the title to do that, so I can't envision him winning unless it's a huge shock swerve that no one sees coming, uh, but... They are still doing a better job building this than I, I expected or had faith in when this match was first announced a couple weeks ago. There was a gauntlet match for to determine the number one contenders to the tag titles. There was a nice hour-long match that I think reminded people that the Street Profits and Pretty Deadly are extremely <laughs> underutilized on SmackDown right now. That tag division as a whole, I think, could use a little bit more. Like This was a good showcase for it. It was ultimately one by Jacob Fatu and Tama Tonga. So I don't know when that match will happen, but those guys versus DIY is going to absolutely crush. Um, and Jacob Fatu, is, he continues to be just a hurricane of charisma and athleticism that is just blinding, <laughs> blindingly white hot. Like that dude is unbelievable. He is going to be running his own bloodline in like six months. But I don't want to see DIY lose the titles at SummerSlam in Gargano's hometown of, of Cleveland. So we'll see what they do there, but I can't imagine they have those guys lose. So I don't know. Maybe it's something where they win to to give this new bloodline some gold, even if Solo's not winning the title. Like, I don't know. We'll see. But it was a cool match. It was a nice showcase for the tag division. But once it's over, you kind of go back to, oh, this division needs a little bit more TLC here. Like, it has some great teams that are just kind of not getting the shine. And on the AEW side, they followed up uh, the one-hour Will Ospreay MJF marathon on Dynamite 250 with the announcement that Will Ospreay will get his rematch against MJF for the international title at AEW All-In in Wembley Stadium, home soil for Will Ospreay. I don't know what they have in, in store to top that hour-long marathon, maybe he'll get two kids to chop MJF or something. Like, I have no idea what the plan is going to be. I trust those guys because they're such good performers at basically, like, the peak of their of their powers and in-ring ability. So I, I'm sure it'll be completely different, whatever it is. And obviously it's not going to have the benefit of having a full hour. But they followed that up with this segment where MJF came out and he introduced a new title... Uh, redesigned international title that is not international it is the united states title with this new usa branded belt and i'm sure he thought he was going to get all sorts of heel heat but he pulled that thing out and the nashville crowd hit the usa chance so proudly and he looked like homelander in that meme out there like huh what huh? oh they liked the okay uh it was a great callback to um, a move that Will Ospreay actually pulled himself in New Japan where he rebranded the IWGP, I believe it was the United States title, and he made it the international title or the UK title. Uh, I should have looked that up before, but it was a really good callback to that. And he even mentioned on social media, I think, like, looks like you've been watching my film. But those guys are going to be awesome again. And a, a crowd like Wembley is going to absolutely lose their minds for Osprey the Conquering Hero returning home. Especially if he wins, that moment is going to be unbelievable. But like I said, they followed up the one-hour MJF Will Osprey match last week with a one-hour blood and guts match with the Elite versus Team AEW. And your mileage may vary on these types of matches because they aren't really, like, matches they're just crazy spot after crazy spot and hardcore spot after hard like just insane stuff uh, if you're not familiar with blood and guts it is essentially the AEW war games with two rings giant steel cage and it does not start until everyone is in the ring from both sides five on five and this match 
I did not have a lot of faith in going into it. I wasn't super high on Team AEW, which was Swerve Strickland, The Acclaimed, Darby Allen, and Mark Briscoe. I was not super psyched on that. I was like, I don't really understand what they're they're building at here. I know the Elite has been, you know, running with this EVP gimmick, and they've been terrorizing everybody. It's like the evil management, but. There was something about it that just wasn't clicking. I'm, I'm happy to say, though, that once they got in the ring and started the match, everything was insane. Like, I, I really, like, it was like, blink and you miss it with crazy spot after crazy spot. Basically, from the second Mark Briscoe got into the ring. And Darby Allen and Jack Perry were the two that started the match. They wrestled the longest. It should be no surprise that they were also the two that took insane amounts of punishment jack perry in particular i think deserves a lot of respect and a lot of props for going out there and just absolutely laying it all on the line with some of the craziest spots that i can remember there was this insane spot with anthony bowens and a pair of golden scissors where he like had the scissors in his mouth there was another spot where darby allen climbed across the top of the cage to drop down and coffin drop Jack Perry through a table. There was uh, a tease that Darby Allen was going to light him on fire if the Elite didn't quit and give him a title match at All In. And the moment that is getting the most talk, of course, is a chair shot from Mark Briscoe to Jack Perry that just looked like instant CTE. In a world of head injuries and, and concussions, being more scrutinized and monitored than ever it looked brutal and a lot of people were quick to come out and say like it's okay the the chair was shaved down it wasn't as bad as it looked or sounded it was a gimmick chair totally fine but on the other side there were a lot of people saying maybe but you kind of can't really gimmick the you know handcuffed unprotected chair shot to the head to be a hundred percent safe all of the time and it's such a such an interesting thing. It's so interesting to see the two sides come out because on the one hand, AEW takes pretty pretty good care to be as safe as possible for their wrestlers. Like you had last week even, they asked, or two weeks ago, they asked um, Owen Hart's uh, widow, Martha Hart, if it would be okay to have Darby Allen descend from the rafters like Sting. They, had, they said, hey, are you okay with it? It was a, a story after the fact. And so they're, they're clearly, you know, always trying to do the right thing and do the safest thing possible. But they've also had a lot of issues with injuries and things happening. Uh, Sammy Guevara hasn't been seen since he accidentally hit a finishing move after concussing Jeff Hardy. The Hardys left the company and Sammy Guevara still has not been seen. And the, the word behind the scenes was that he had been suspended. Now, obviously... He and his wife welcomed a child in the meantime as well, so that's part of it. But it's a little odd to have that be such a well-known story. And then also have a moment like this where Mark Briscoe like, just throws this chair as hard as he can into Jack Perry's head. So there was a lot of, a lot of back and forth online, as I'm sure you could probably imagine if you were not seeing it yourself. Uh, Corey Graves even came into the fold and tweeted out a little thing about it and about it just not being worth it and he quickly deleted that as well he didn't say anything by name i thought what he said was was you know kind of kind of poignant i he's someone who i don't always agree with but having his career be cut short because of head injuries and concussions and problems like that i think he he comes from a, a good place with it it's just such a uh i it's a shame it's gotten to this point where you know a wwe person or a fan speaking on something that happens in the other company or vice versa immediately gets shot down as some type of tribalism so all in all it was a good blood and guts match it was so much better than i expected i don't really remember the other ones outside of a couple moments here and there i would have to go back and watch them which may be coming soon if uh overseas hbo max updates are to be believed but as, as far as I'm concerned, this was, was a great blood and guts match. Maybe in part because I had such low expectations for it. But Swerve Strickland, before finishing the talk of this, Swerve Strickland, that dude is just a charisma machine. And I'm so happy he had the moments that he got in this match. Because 
they have done a lot since that Osprey match. I was really disappointed when he beat Will Osprey at Forbidden Door and then was not on Dynamite the next week. But since then, he has been back kind of with a vengeance. We know he's going to wrestle Brian Danielson at All In. And then here, he was made to look like an absolute world beater. He gets handcuffed to the cage by Hangman Adam Page, who waited to come out until Swerve was coming out. It was it was a great bit of character work on, on the part of Hangman. And beats him up, hang, handcuffs him to the cell, finally goes in to start the match. And then, you know, Jeff Jarrett, Prince Nana, all those guys come out and free Swerve. He goes in there and just starts cleaning house, like like looking like a champion should. And on top of all of that, they do this insane spot where all of the elite have staple guns and they start like stapling swerve all over with these staple guns and i I don't remember who said it but they were like dude those staples are like the uh the sensu beans and dragon ball z or something because he hulked up and got his own staple gun and it was it's as gross as it sounds if that doesn't sound like your type of wrestling like it's exactly what it sounds like like he stapled all of them (laughs) um and just powered up and like it was it was crazy it's so weird to describe like if i was trying to tell a non-wrestling fan about this they would probably look at me like i was crazy but he absolutely came out looking like a million bucks i think jack perry probably hopefully silenced a lot of critics and doubters with his performance uh even though there was also a controversy that came out of his role in the match because there always is apparently uh, and and all in all, it, it was interesting, too, because it, it almost made the debate of, like, should it be Hangman Adam Page versus Swerve for the world title instead of Brian Danielson? Because the crowd was electric for those guys every time they came in contact, even when they just stared at each other. It was, it was just this electric buzz because of what those two dudes have done previously and what everyone knows they're capable of. I don't think so. I think the Brian Danielson story that they're telling and I think a match with Swerve is going to be incredible and is very worthy of that spotlight because, again, it elevates Swerve even more win or lose, but especially if he wins. So I understand it. I understand putting one of your biggest stars with your up-and-coming champion on your biggest show. It's just, it you know, it's hard to ignore the electricity that those two guys, Swerve and Hangman, have when they get together and then the last thing from AEW dynamite is that chris jericho and minoru suzuki may still be chopping each other right now they had this match that like it's it's hard to call a match a hoss fight when neither of the guys are hosses but like they just like beat the hell out of each other and i don't know when jericho decided he was just gonna start wrestling these like stiff hard type hardcore matches but more power to him. He was bleeding within like the first two minutes of chops from Minoru Suzuki, who continues to have one of the best nicknames in pro wrestling with uh, Murder Grandpa. <laughs> this just tells you everything you need to know. And then speaking of good nicknames, we also got the, the re-debut, the debut, if you will, of the glamour Mariah May who squashed a local competitor in like two minutes with some brutal looking drop kicks and then used a couple Tony Storm moves for good measure, only to then be attacked by Tony Storm, who has not been seen since Mariah May's shocking betrayal. Uh, but that's good. speaking of crowds that are electric for, for potential matches, that match might be the match of All In because the crowd was going insane for the two of them when they, they finally like stared down and started to try to go at each other. And Tony Storm grabs the mic and screams like, I hope you're ready to die for this because I'm ready to die for this. Like, it's crazy. Like, it's going to be so good. And it's, it's you know, a testament to the storytelling that those guys and Tony Khan and RJ City have been, have been working on because it's so effective and it's made everyone involved look so good. And it's only going to continue to get better, I'm sure, until we finally do get to All In, where... The crowd is going to probably go insane. Like, I can't imagine what that reaction is going to be for Mariah May, who is a hometown girl there, and Tony Storm, who is Australian, of course, but probably just as beloved there as well. Like, it's going to be quite something to see. 
And before I hop off for today, before I end today, a couple other things I really want to just give quick shout outs to. First off is Joe Burrow for deciding that to get the best out of the Bengals this season to be his best and his healthiest. He needs to channel his inner Cody Rhodes. He hit the bleached blonde Eminem Slim Shady buzz cut look at Bengals training camp this week. Uh, Cody Rhodes even went so far as to notice, told him to finish the story because of course. Uh, so we'll see. Maybe that means the Bengals are shoe-ins to win the Super Bowl this year. Maybe not. But it is pretty crazy how, how much he looks like him. And then also, I did not do a show last week. I had a bunch of stuff going on. But I wanted to shout out TNA Slammiversary because TNA Slammiversary this year was sold out. It was one of the largest crowds they've had for a pay-per-view in recent years. It was in Canada. It was in Montreal. And top to bottom, that card was unbelievable. Those guys really overachieved. Like, I, I wasn't sure because I'm not a regular TNA watcher. But everyone involved really dug deep and pulled out some incredible performances. And there was a lot of, obviously, former WWE stars. You had Wes Lee and the Rascals taking on the No Quarter Catch crew who are also NXT guys. And at TNA and, and WWE continues to be like the gift that keeps on giving with these collaborations and crossovers. Uh, Joe Hendry, one of the hottest wrestlers in in the business right now, I think. Uh, he is going to be continuing to pop up on NXT more regularly. Had the crowd so behind him to hopefully win the TNA world title, but alas, it did not happen. He will now presumably spend the next few months chasing that belt. And when he finally gets it, it is going to be a huge moment. Uh, and like I said, I'm not a huge TNA watcher, but the, the way they've been doing and the, the total presentation and everything has got me a lot more interested and invested than I had been before. That is for sure. So if you have not been watching TNA Weekly, uh, it's every Thursday. It's worth popping in on. I, it's, it's a little different from the other wrestling shows from a production value and everything for sure. And a presentation value for sure but some of the the wrestlers there are just absolutely killing it night in and night out when they get the chances so just wanted to highlight that as well really quick i did not get the chance to last week uh, and we close every week every show talking about some of the best matches of the week the things that you should absolutely go back and watch if you did not get the chance to see it before this next week of wrestling starts because obviously SummerSlam this coming week Going to have some big go-home shows. The all-in build is continuing on the AW side of things. That card is only going to get more and more filled out as well. Check these matches out before we dive into another crazy week of wrestling as we head towards SummerSlam next week. Thank you guys very much for watching, listening. You can subscribe on YouTube, uh, anywhere you get your podcasts as well. It is available. I appreciate everyone. Have a good week. And I will see you next week for SummerSlam predictions. So, matches to watch this week. We have Ilya Dragunov versus Braun Breaker for Monday Night Raw. We have the Rascals versus Javon Evans, Axiom, and Nathan Frazier from NXT. We have the Blood and Guts match. The Elite versus Team AEW from this week's Dynamite. And then from tonight, Friday Night's. Ring of Honor, Death Before Dishonor pay-per-view. Something I also don't really talk about or, or keep up with a whole lot. We have Athena versus Queen Aminata for the Ring of Honor Women's World title. And we have Mark Briscoe versus Roderick Strong for the Ring of Honor World title as well. If you get the chance to catch any of those, please do. Athena continues to be probably the best, <laughs> the best wrestler on the ring of honor roster and one of if not the top women's wrestler all around the work she is doing is incredible and this match just continues to solidify that so check these out if you are looking for any wrestling to watch and get ready as we gear up to SummerSlam. thank you very much awesome.